Welcome and thank you all for attending tonight's Trail Talks. Uh, I'm Ahmad Mirza, I'm a librarian here with the Santa Barbara Public Library. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to make a few announcements. Uh, if you registered for the event on the library's calendar, you should get an email with the webinar information so to get you to this room here. Um, if you're placed on the wait list, uh, we will then send you the link uh, on the day of the event. So if you see that the event is full, still sign up for it because we can still uh, get you in. Um, I have another, there's another quick announcement. Um, we have a date for the talk that was rescheduled from last month. Uh, for those who didn't know, uh, Sarah Dykeman was evacuated uh, because of a fire and was not able to have her talk Bicycling with Butterflies. Uh, but good news, she is doing well and is ready and happy to come back to present for us. Uh, the new date for that talk is gonna be, please mark your calendars, everybody, October 14th, that's a Thursday night at 5.30 p.m. Uh, you can register for that event at the uh, on the library's website as well. We can send the links out uh, for the webinar for that. And uh, there's a few other that, uh, talks that we have lined up that we're gonna be announcing um, here soon. Uh, before I introduce uh, James this evening, uh, I wanted to say uh, if anyone has any questions uh, during the presentation to please put them in the chat. Uh, if we have limited time at the end of the presentation, if we have time at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll try to get to everyone's questions, uh, if allowed. Uh, the presentation will be recorded and we plan to put it up on the library's YouTube page. Uh, for everyone who's registered and on the wait list, I will send a, uh, once it's on the YouTube page, I will send the links to everyone who is registered for the event. Um, very exciting stuff, the YouTube, everybody. <laughs> and, uh, the next part here, my favorite part. Uh, I have the pleasure tonight uh, of introducing James Wapatich. Uh, James is our library partner for these Trail Talk series. Uh, he's an experienced backpacker, trail guide, and author of the Santa Barbara News Press hiking column, Trail Quest. I uh, just wanna say a big thank you to James for helping and coordinating uh, these events with us. Uh, if anyone here is interested uh, in following James's adventures, uh, you can check out his blog, www.songs with an s songs of the wilderness.com once again i'm gonna plug i love to plug james i'm just gonna keep plugging it check out the blog www.songsofthewilderness.com tonight's talk will highlight the backpacking opportunities to our four backcountry hot springs little caliente agua caliente willet and sespi hot springs it will also cover more than half a dozen destinations with generally reliable year round water. And with that, I wanted to pass the floor to James now with his presentation, Hot and Cold Backcountry Springs of the Santa Barbara and Ojai Mountains. Thank you, James, so much for joining us this evening, leading this talk. Thank you, Ahmad. Thank you for that introduction. And of course, thank you to the library for hosting this series. Um, in without the pandemic interruption, we've been doing this for about three years now. Uh, so it's great that there's been so much engagement and so many people interested in these topics. Um, so yeah, I might introduce what the, the topic is gonna be tonight. Uh, so maybe I'll skip past that. Uh, so I do have a couple of quick announcements. Uh, there's a very exciting event coming up uh, October 10th, hosted by the Montecito Trails Foundation in collaboration with the Barbarino Band of Chumash Indians. Um, and the Tribal Trust Foundation. It's uh, in recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day. And it's um, it's really just acknowledging the fact that these trails have been here uh, much longer than us. And that many of these trails uh, in our backcountry and front country are historic Chumash routes. And so part of the hike will be an interpretive map uh, that will call out some of the different features and you know their Chumash names. Uh, for the plants and some of the other natural history. And it's a guided hike, so it's free. Just go to the Montecito Trails Foundation website and you can register and you get all the details uh, to go to this free event. Um, I'm also excited to kind of break the news here that uh, I'm hosting a, a workshop at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, uh, Sunday, November 7th. And uh, it's on introduction to wildlife camera tracking. And I'd say for about the five, the past five years, uh, I've been actively using wildlife cameras. I have about 
a half a dozen sites in the back country and also here in town uh, that I've been getting photos from. And all the pictures here on the screen are actually from my cameras. And so the, the class is gonna have two parts. Uh, one is like a presentation on how to select a camera and how to pick a good site to place your camera. And then we'll also be doing a hands-on uh, installing of our cameras. So uh, that should be pretty exciting. Uh, I'll put an announcement on my blog once the details are finalized. And then also a number of people ask me if I'm leading any hikes, any guided hikes. And so I actually do have a series of five hikes coming up starting in October called Take Five Hikes. And the intention is to take a break from basically all the stressors in the world right now and get it on the trails. And on each of those hikes, I'll be offering some interpretive information as well as mixing in what I would call, you know, wilderness awareness skills, uh, mindfulness, and just other practices that I have that help uh, deepen and enrich the experience on the trails and just help us better appreciate where we live. Um, so the first hike will be in October and uh, that one's called Nature's Bounty. The theme will be working with edible and medicinal plants. Uh, the second one is Islands in a Sea of Chaparral. And that's gonna be focusing on the interplay between riparian and chaparral plants and what it has to teach us about, you know, how the land organizes itself and how we could get into alignment with that. And then the Great River is also gonna explore uh, some of the geology, but just also how did everything get here in the first place? And then the door at the center will be a mindfulness workshop. And then the last one, finding your way home, is just how to integrate some of these uh, nature awareness skills into, into our hiking and our daily lives. So I'll put that on my blog as well. So the, the inspiration for this talk for me was uh, a little bit as Ahmad said, we're going into the fall here. And a question that always seems to come up in the fall is like, where can you go backpacking? Where can you find water? Uh, so I really sat down and gave it some thought like, gee, where are the places that I often go or recommend to people? And then also occurred to me that in the fall, it's kind of a nice time to go to the hot springs uh, just because, you know, as the weather kind of gets cooler, it's actually a fun place to go. In the middle of summer, the hot springs aren't that exciting, right? Uh, but once we get into mid-October, our temperatures start to dip down into uh, what we call the more pleasant range, and it just makes it more appealing to get out into the backcountry. So yeah, the big question is, where is there water? Um, some of you may know that we live in an area that is semi-arid, and so in the springtime, you could have this glorious display of water. Uh, this is Horseshoe Bend, and uh, this is a, a typical April scene where this pool is just full of water, um, but then come even summer, it's just gone. There's no water at this particular site. Uh, and what's interesting, this is along Manzana Creek, is just a couple miles upstream, is um, cold water camp and that has year round water. And so that really got me interested over the years of like, well, what are the places that have water and what are the places that don't? And is it possible to kind of track that? Uh, and what I kind of noticed in just my own practice of tracking where there is water and where there isn't water is that there's a lot of variables. Um, it can change because amount of rain that we get. Um, so I put this in there because this is even interesting. This shows the amount of rain over a hundred year average of where it's landing in the county. So you can see that the places with the most amount of rainfall on average is the San Inez Mountains. And then the backcountry gets less water. So it's not even evenly distributed, but over the course of the year, it's also not evenly distributed as well in the sense that there can be places with a great deal, not a great deal, but you know, that have water and other places that don't. Um, so another variable of course is the amount of rain. And, what I like about this one chart here is it shows the El Nino and the La Nina years. I know some of this is kind of technical, but the, the takeaway for me when I look at this chart is that although El Nino does influence how much rain we get, it's not the entire story, that there are more variables. So even if we have a La Nina year coming up um, like we do now, we could still get some decent rain. Um, this one chart ends at 2013, uh, but this other one, this is from the Santa Barbara County um, Santa Barbara County website, their water department. Uh, if you look down here in the corner, I wish I had my pointer, but I can't point. Uh, from 2012 to 2016, we had a five-year drought. Um, it was below average rainfall, and it really changed the, the water situation in the backcountry. Um, and why I'm kind of referring to this chart, I know this is like a little technical, but um, you're going to hear me over the course of this talk use like basically three different terms to describe the water availability of places. One is I'm going to call someplace generally reliable. Um, and these are places that generally do have year round water. But why I'm using that word generally is that conditions always change in the backcountry, And so I can't really give you a hard and fast prediction like, yes, you'll find water there, but it's, it's likely. And then there's the other category where it's like, well, that place never has water in the fall. So that generally doesn't have water. But then there's this middle category of like, it depends on the year. 
Like if you were to ask me, that's what I would say. Well, it kind of depends on what kind of rain we've gotten. And not just on what kind of rain we got in this year, but what was the previous year like too? Like if you look at this chart, it's like 2019, we had some great year, some great water and 2020, we also did. So those two together kind of, kind of give us a little bit of lift, but we've gone into a really dry year. Um, so coming out of that drought, you know, even though we had a great year in 2017, um, it wasn't necessarily enough to recharge everything. And uh, what I mean by recharge, if you've been up the West Cold Spring Trail, you've probably seen this. This is the Cold Spring Tunnel. And this is basically a horizontal well or what's uh, like a straw into the mountain. And the thing to understand about our mountains is that they're, they're porous. When it rains, the, the water filters into the mountains and it acts like a big sponge. And so the idea of this tunnel was to tap into that by putting a straw into the mountain to draw the water out. Uh, so even if we have like a great year and then a bad year and then a great year, um, the impact of how much water available in the water can, can be um, mitigated a little bit by how much water is in that sponge, right? So if we have too many dry years, then that sponge starts to dry up and a great year of rain doesn't offset that entirely. Uh, so that's, that's why it kind of depends on some of these sites in the backcountry is what kind of rain did we get this year and last year and where are we in the overall rain pattern? Uh, but I'm gonna focus mostly on the places that generally have reliable water because these are places that are pretty safe bets. Um, also want to talk about the, the trees for a little bit. Um, so this is along the Manzana. This is a place with uh, generally year round water, but why I have this in here is two reasons is uh, a tree that will tell you if there's generally year round water is the alder trees. Uh, alder trees, as my friend Lanny likes to say, likes to have their feet wet, right? So they're going to be right here along the side of the creek and they're going to pick a spot where they can get water almost year round. Uh, if you see a place with a lot of alder trees that are green and there's not water, it's because it's just the short window where there's not year round water. So this can be like an indicator tree. Uh, another thing about trees that's worth understanding is in a, around the late spring, about May, June, it kind of depends where the temperature and what the rain is like. The trees will actually start to suck up water as they go into summer. And that can actually lower the creeks more dramatically than evaporation would. And then the reverse of that happens when we move into the fall, when it gets to like October, November, maybe November, when the temperatures drop down enough that the trees don't need to hold on to that much water, that the creeks will actually rise a little, even though there's been no rain. Um, so that's another factor that's influencing how much water you see in the creek. And I'm kind of mentioning all this because there are just no hard and fast answers of what you'll find in the backcountry. You really have to develop what I would call tracking skills, where you observe each time you're in the backcountry what the conditions are like and how they're changing and sort of build up in your mind a sense of like, oh, here how it's different. Oh, last year it was like this. Um, and these, these are really just tracking skills and they can, they can help you a lot more in the backcountry than a list of places or you know, someone's chart of what there is. Um, because you partly also have to change your expectations when you go into the backcountry. Um, I've been you know, out on a day hike on a, on a summer afternoon and just dying of heat and come to a, po a pool of water that you know has like leaves on it and doesn't look like it's flowing and cleared the leaves away and been like, oh my God, this is like a life-saving pool of water because I can cool off finally. Whereas in the spring, I might be like, yeah, I'm not really that hot. That water doesn't look so great. And if I was like a water snob, I'd probably just, you know, overheat. Um, I've also gone to camps where people tell me, oh, there's no water there. But then if I just go downstream a little bit, I do actually find water. And so, it's more just about being flexible and being open rather than like, hey, there's no water at camp. I guess I can't camp here. It's like, well, look around. And part of what will help you look around is if you if you develop these tracking skills so that you have a better way or a better sense of uh, what are some good clues to where there would be water. Uh, that said, there is also an online resource that I wanna make you aware of. This is a Hike Los Padres. And this is a, a website that's, um, was put together by Brian Conan and some other people associated with the Los Padres Sports Association. And it has user generated reports on the trails uh, and the camps. And uh, for me, one of the most useful features is the water reports. And these are all user generated. So I go on a hike, I, I go onto this website and I just update, I just put in a report of like what I saw, was there water, was there not water? So you can kind of quickly scan this website uh, and just kind of be like, oh, here's some places that seem like they had water recently, right? Or another approach is to um, search for the site, I mean, the camp that you're interested in. Slow. 
Oh, because of Zoom, I get it. Uh -huh. So I picked Haddock Camp for a reason. Um, well, here, let me show you. So here's the water reports for this place. So someone has been there <clears throat> in August and says that it's dry. Um, so if I was thinking of going to Haddock and was curious about the water, I might also look back at some other autumn dates, you know, like, hey, what's the water like in autumn? Hmm, kind of a trickle back then, you know, oh, flowing in November. Hmm, maybe that was a good year for rain. You know, maybe we had a storm or something that brought it back up. Um, so I could scan through here. Um, while the November, you know, in 2014 was dry, that might have been a dry year. Um, you can also drill down into the reports that people have placed <clears throat> and get a little more detail. And why I picked Haddock is one year I did actually look this up. I, I looked at the water report for April and it was like flowing water. And then I looked at it like late May and it was like, oh, water a quarter mile downstream. And then I looked at it for August, water a mile, half mile downstream. And it, it kind of showed me that like the water, um, that it's not black and white, that it's not like, hey, there's water there or there isn't, that there could actually be water nearby if you're willing to look. And this site is only as good as the people who report on it. And since people don't go out as much in the fall, you're not going to get as much information. But learning how to extrapolate the information can kind of, you know, give you some confidence of like, huh, I might likely find water there or somewhere nearby. Um, so that's that's how that's a useful resource. That's Hyklos Padres. And if you just Google Hyklos Padres, that's like the first site that comes up. All right, so I'm going to be talking about <clears throat> several different things. I'm going to cover the four backcountry hot springs, as Ahmad said, um, plus just some other places that have, you know, generally reliable water. And I'm just going to mix them up together. But on the four hot springs, I'm going to hit the ones here, Little Caliente and Agua Caliente. I'm going to skip the front country ones because I wanted to focus on places you could backpack to. Um, with the road closure, Romero Saddle, the only way to get to Big and Little Caliente is to backpack in or, or ride your bike or take your horse. Um, but you can't drive there now. so. Technically, it's a backcountry hot spring now. And then the two backcountry ones in Ventura County are Willett and Sespe. And then I'll cover the other ones as we kind of go through that area. So the first place I want to talk about is Little Pine Spring. This is actually one of my favorite areas. Uh, the hike up to Little Pine Spring is about um, six and a half miles. Uh, I wish I had my pointer. But anyways, you, you start over by Upper Oso, and you hike up the Santa Cruz Trail, and it climbs up away from the valley and crosses over to the backside of the mountains. And in Little Pine Spring generally has year-round water and the trail continues to Santa Cruz Camp. Uh, so here's, here's a typical view of Oso Creek in the fall. It's usually dry. Uh, sometimes there's a little water near 19 Oaks, but it, that's one of those places that it really depends on the year, uh, whether or not you're gonna find any kind of water there. So <clears throat> I would personally put this in a category of like, I'm probably not gonna go there in the fall because I don't know if I could find water, but I would definitely go to Little Pine Spring. Um, so the trail climbs away from, like I say, from Oso Canyon. If you look sort of in the center of the um, image here, that's a view towards 19 Oaks. And it just continues to climb up the top of the mountain. This trail was badly damaged in the Ray Fire, uh, particularly in the slide area, if you can see the, the bracing walls. Um, this is like somewhat like a year or so after the Ray Fire, and it's kind of grown back. So it's, it's gotten better. This is a view of what this area looked like before the fire. So it's always been kind of challenging because of these shale slides that you have to kind of scramble across. Um, but the fire burned some of the retaining walls. So now it's a little more challenging. Um, it's gotten easier over the years just because more people have hiked it. Um, but it still kind of looks like this. The trail does need work. Uh, so if you're not like confident in your backcountry skills, you might want to skip this this particular hike, but if, if you go out regularly, this is it's a worthwhile investment of, of your energy. Um, it does crest out here at Alexander Saddle. Uh, that trail, um, you see that trail running up the ridge, that's the trail that goes up the Little Pine Mountain. So that that's actually a nice day hike to ride out there and back. Um, but from here, the trail continues down the backside of the mountain. And this is also an area that got some real slide damage. Uh, this was actually the sketchier part of the trail back when it first happened because um, the slides just kind of covered the entire trail. Uh, the stuff has gotten a lot more hard packed now and some people are walking it, so you can kind of find a way across it. Um, I would not recommend this after a big rain because it'll change the characteristic of this, uh, but I've been out there at least six times um, since the Ray Fire and, and conditions keep improving and I, I would go again. You know, Some places I wouldn't go again because it was too much work or I felt uncomfortable, but this, this trail isn't too bad. Um, so it continues on its way down to Little Pine Spring. Oh, I put this in here because I was out here in Memorial Day and did get to see a rattlesnake. 
uh, I was kind of joking to my buddy when we we're out there that I was a little disappointed that it didn't rattle at us. I kind of felt like, gee, we didn't rate. We weren't like menacing enough, but um, it just, we gave it some space and it worked its way off the trail. And then of course, as we walked by, it rattled at us because it, it must've heard what I said. Uh, and then on that same hike, the day before we saw uh, California king snake. So that was kind of cool to see both of them on the same hike. Uh, here's the turn off the little pine spring. Um, the trick to finding this place, because some people do have a hard time finding it is, uh, this is looking back up to where that turnoff is, is you kind of follow the edge of where the grass meets the um, chaparral for a while, and then that kind of peels away and goes out into the grass, and then eventually it cuts across down to the camp. Um, I don't have like a better descriptor of that, but it, if you if you just follow the edge of that at first, you'll pick up the trail, and then the rest of it is just kind of using your route finding skills. Um, it's a cozy little camp with a picnic table. I love how this fire ring is these uh, metamorphic rocks. These are... Um, like the cinnabar rocks that you'd find over at Red Rock. And then back here is the spring. Uh, I would say this is, I'm gonna use the word generally reliable. I've only heard one person tell me that I saw that it was dry ones and I'm not really sure if they were actually accurate because like I've seen the trough empty but I've always seen water coming out of the pipe. And uh, Carrie Kellogg, who was the wilderness trails manager for the Santa Barbara Ranger District for 25 years has said he's never seen this dry. So I'm, I'm kind of gonna lean on his, uh, his expertise on that one. When I was here one time with a buddy of mine, we were uh, standing around the, the picnic table having our breakfast, drinking our coffee, and I'm just kind of aimlessly looking, you know, up at the hillside because you can see the trail from the camp, and I see this bear walking down the trail, and I'm like, what? And then he looks at me like, what? There, what be? And so we both have this like moment of kind of exchanging glasses, glances, uh, and so he, he stopped and checked us out for a moment. Um, that tag in his ear, ear suggests that he might have been like a, a bad bear, meaning a bear who got too habituated on people, was maybe going into campgrounds or something, and got relocated here. Uh, but his behavior was still what I would call typical of our backcountry is once he saw us, he just he scampered off down a trail. Uh, a lot of the bears in the southern Los Padres where we are um, are, are typically, they, they don't want to interact with people and they will just scamper off. I've had more than like a half a dozen bear encounters and they've all ended with the bear, you know, running away and sometimes can't even get a picture. Um, versus like in other areas where they're a little more aggressive, where they have associated with people, people uh, with opportunities for food. Um, and it is important to like not keep your food out where bears can get it, whether in a residential area or out in the back country, because anytime there's a conflict with a bear and a human, the bear is the one that's going to lose. And we don't actually need to leave our food out. Like that's the choice we can make. Um, so it's really, it's us taking care of the bears by not doing that. This is some bear scat. I didn't put a ton of bear scat photos in this, but this one, I did a hike down the Santa Cruz trail in September and there was nothing but this kind of bear scat all over the trail. And what these are is holly leaf cherry pits. And, you know, when I started seeing this, I was like, wow, man, there must be like a big cherry grove somewhere. Cause there's like so much of this. And if, if you hike down the, the section of the 40 mile wall, uh, all those green bushes or most of them are all cherry cherry trees or cherry bushes. And uh, when you got when I got on this one section right here where the um, trail passes through these trees, there was just tons of bear scat. Like they were just raiding this cherry grove. It was kind of cool to see. Um, so this is a what holly leaf cherry looks like. This is a native plant and just seeing that grove of cherries reminds me of the book Tending the Wild by Kat Anderson, um, where she basically describes how native people like the Shumash here would actually tend the plants in the backcountry. You know, different than agriculture, it's the practice of horticulture, where you're basically ensuring that the next year there'll be more of this plant that you can harvest. Uh, you know, the classic example is like uh, Brodia, which has a bulb on it that the Shumash would harvest, that when they would come and harvest it, they would still leave some, they would also weed the area, they would replant some of them, you know, a few feet, uh, several inches away to kind of open up space so more would grow back. And, you know, that's different than being like, what we're kind of led to believe that like, oh, native people are like foraging or scavenging because their practice isn't to take everything, because if you did that, there would be nothing next year, right? So horticulture is more about, you know, taking some resources to sustain yourself, but then also ensuring that there'll be resources next year because this is where you live, right? So you're not going to just like decimate all your resources. You're going to work in relationship with nature. So next year, there's also this resource that you can utilize. Um, holly leaf cherry was a, a valuable resource or is a valuable resource to the Shumash, uh, not for the fruit, but for the pit. 
Um, the pit can be harvested. Um, you have to leach it, similar to acorns, in this case, to get out the cyanic acid, um, but it is edible. And uh, it's actually by volume twice as valuable as acorns because it's just, it's not more rare, but there's less of it. Uh, so this was like an important food plant. And to see uh, so many trees, like sort of not in a grove arrangement, but like looking like they could be a grove really is like, wow, I wonder if this is, you know, an old, an old Chumash uh, tended area. Um, I've seen like four or five different places in the backcountry with like just tons of cherry trees. So I often wonder that. Um, so Santa Cruz Trail uh, from Little Pine Spring wraps around the mountains and gets down to Santa Cruz Creek. Um, this is from Thanksgiving, uh, like 2014. I went here with uh, my girlfriend, Sierra, and this is what the water looked like. And I didn't find this water particularly appealing. You know, it had some sulfury smell. Uh, it was still usable. Um, some people, you know, say Santa Cruz Creek, you know, all flows year round. Hyclos Padres, uh, I saw a report for August said that it's completely dry. Uh, so I would, I would, this is in the category of like, kind of depends on the year. Um, this is Santa Cruz camp. There's uh, like three or four different sites that you can camp at. This is the old Santa Cruz guard station. It's, it's close to the public, but you know, it's sort of iconic in a sense. From uh, Santa Cruz camp, uh, the trail continues over to Flores Flats. Uh, this is a shot I took uh, walking in the trail, kind of approaching Flores Flat. And uh, when I took this photo, I, I saw some movement, but it wasn't until I got home that I could zoom in to see what the movement actually was. And it turned out uh, we'd flushed out a coyote and scampered up the hillside. Uh, Flores Flats is about three miles from Santa Cruz camp. And I would say that there generally is water there. Uh, you might have to look around for it. This is uh, that same year, 2014. Um, like I said, I wasn't that impressed with the water by Santa Cruz camp, but when we got up towards Flores, uh, a couple of the crossings weren't that good, but just at the outskirts of the camp, um, we did find this water. So that was that was pretty cool. Um, from Flores, Santa Cruz Trail continues up uh, Coche, it follows Coche Creek. So I guess you could call that Coche Canyon. And it arrives at Kellogg Camp. And every time I've been there, spring, summer, fall, I've seen water at Kellogg Camp. So I'm inclined to call that um, reliable water. Uh, the camp is named after Kerry Kellogg. As I said, he was a wilderness trails manager for 25 years with um, the Santa Barbara Ranger District. Um, in this shot, you might see this picnic table of sorts. Um, it's more like a hunter's table, but um, this is pretty close to when it was put in. Uh, this is a couple years later when the bears started utilizing it for, um, I guess they work out or something. No, that's, uh, they just like to scratch on stuff and let people know this is where they hang out too. Um, I don't think there's much left to this table anymore. So just past uh, Kellogg Camp, it meets the, uh, the Grapevine Trail. So from here, Santa Cruz Trail goes up to the top of the San Rafael Mountains. Uh, but Grapevine Trail continues from here and goes up to Pelch Camp, uh, which does, um, which also does have year-round water. The, the camp was named for uh, Pelch and Pinkham, who had a, a hunting camp out there uh, back in the 30s. And they would do deer hunting up uh, at Mission Pine Basin on the San Rafael Mountains, but they might go out for like a week or 10 days <clears throat> to do fishing and hanging out and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is uh, Amanda Pelch. Uh, I used to buy car insurance from her. And I was sitting in her office one day looking at the, the name placard on her desk and kind of said, Pelch, is that any connection to the backcountry camp? And she got like super quiet and looked at me kind of intensely. And I was, I was afraid that I broached a topic that I shouldn't have brought up. And then she said, how do you know about that? And I was like, oh, I was in the Boy Scouts. You know, we, we uh, went to this place. It, it's pretty cool. And then when I wrote an article about Grapevine Trail, I, I, I tracked her down because I figured she would have some good history about the camp and learned that she'd never actually been there. Uh, so... I realized that the Los Padres Forest Association does volunteer trail projects. And I got her to go out on one and we hiked down and did a survey of the trail so she could see it. And so that was kind of cool for her to get a chance to see this place that, you know, her family uh, used to go hunting at. Um, so this little map shows, you know, Kellogg, Coche and Pelch. And from Pelch, the trail continues up to Bluff Camp. I used to think that that spring up there was a reliable water source, but Hike Los Padres just reported on their website that uh, it's, it's stagnant. So it's like, hmm. I guess it really does depend on the water. And this has been a pretty dry year. Same with the Upper Indian. Uh, the next place I wanna show you is this is Manzana. Um, unfortunately, right now, the road back to Naira uh, is closed at uh, Kachuma Saddle where I put in that little blue diamond on this map. So it's closed at Kachuma Saddle. And as you probably know right now, the entire forest is closed until at least the 22nd of September. Um, 
but this specific area is going to be closed till March of 2022. Uh, so that's a little frustrating because you can't get back in there. But I put it in here because, um, you know, I'm going to introduce you to like a bunch of different places that you could potentially go backpacking in the fall. And there's no way you're going to get to all of them. So this is a good one to have in your trick bag because it's like, you know, if that road was open, this is like a pretty reliable place to go uh, and do a nice overnighter or a three day trip. I threw in some mileage here just sort of as an assist. Um, just so you could get a feel for how far these things are and which one, how far you might have to go to get some water. So this is what it looks like. Um, this is last October. I went up last October with my girlfriend, Sierra, and we backpacked in for a three-day trip. And this, of course, what it looks like in the springtime. So, you know, uh, our backcountry is a land of contrast where, you know, it's like often feast or famine, you know, wow, great year. All the waterfalls look really wonderful. You know, three years of like hmm, kind of meager rain. Um, so the first campsite is actually Lost Valley, but that's only a mile in. So I often don't even like count that as a place that I would go. Although I have seen water there in the fall. Um, this is a uh, near Fish Creek camp, and this is at the confluence of Fish Creek and Manzana Creek. And in the springtime, there's a lovely waterfall, uh, a lovely swim hole here. But even as you move into summer, it just disappears. Um, this was like a, a site that actually did teach me a, a valuable lesson because I was out here in November one year, way back in like 20, 2008 or whatever, and there was some water. So I started thinking like, wow, it's Labor Day and there's water here. I'll always find water here. And then, you know, two years later, I'm out there in the summer and there's like no water. I was like, oh, huh. Um, so it, it, part of that is just tracking and building up sort of a, a list in your mind of places that do or don't have water. So the camp is dry right now. Um, but you can hike up Fish Creek, and it's it's a pretty easy hike. It's about a mile, and there is a, a reliable water source up there, a little pool that does have water. I don't know how useful that would be for camping because you know you got to go walk a mile to get your water. But if you're doing a day hike, you could make this a destination, or if you're building that into your day, that's something you could do. Um, you know, I'm realizing that when I do these talks in person, I usually ask people if they have questions just to feel free to interrupt me. But way the the chat thing is, that's not going to be easy. So um, I'm going to do a little experiment in mindfulness. If you have a, a really burning question, just try to concentrate on it. And out of the different things I could be saying about these places, maybe that will steer me towards, you know, answering your question and, and not even knowing it. Um, so the next camp is Ray's camp. This is about five miles in. Um, in, a, in a good year of rain, this is where you might start seeing water. Uh, this year, I doubt there'd be water there or it might be like standing water. Um, so it can kind of change how far down the canyon you could count on water. When I was out there in August, I mean, October of last year with, with my girlfriend, it was it was stagnant water. I wouldn't have wanted to camp there. Um, these are just some bit different birds that we saw. Uh, it is sort of true or interesting that when we're in a, a drought period or even just in the um, fall when water can do, when there's less water available, that it, it can sort of concentrate the wildlife a little bit because they're going to be drawn into you know, fewer water sources, increases the density of animals uh, accessing the water because there's less places. Uh, so I did get to see, we got to see some birds a little more easy. So we've got a, a flicker up here, a canyon wren. Uh, I think this is ruby crown sparrow, I might be wrong. And then um, a stellar jay. This is, um, actually this is looking back down into uh, Manzana, Manzana camp. And this is about six miles in and as I was saying, as you go up the canyon, each time you get a little bit further, the water chances improve. Uh, I wish I had my pointer, I could just point where the camp is, but it's basically just right down in there. And back in October, that's where the water just started getting nice, was literally like just right below camp. Like you could walk down the street, I mean the creek, um, and see where the water ended. And it was interesting, we were out there for two days and where the water ended actually went downstream a little bit, even though, like I was saying, there was no rain, but I think the trees were just letting go of some taking up less water, because it's interesting to see the, the water go a little bit further downstream over the course of three days. Uh, I went one year in 2017 and there was no water at Manzana Narrows and this would be a tough year to find, I mean, sorry, no water at Manzana. And that could actually be true this year just because of the drought. Um, so the first place I saw water that year was halfway between Manzana and Manzana Narrows. And then this was the water I saw and I was like, wow, this is some great water. Um, this is uh, Manzana Narrows Camp. This is the waterfall. This is from you know the spring when it's always really going great. Uh, I was up there one year, that same year, 2017, 
and this pool was actually stagnant. It was standing, and that, that kind of spooked me because I'm like, wow, I've never seen this place not have water. Gee, I, I could be wrong about it being reliable. But then I walked downstream just a little bit and found where it was flowing, and it was usable. Uh, so this is this is definitely at the very high end of reliable. Um, so past Manzana Narrows, the trail continues up in branches, and you can continue up to Big Cone Spruce. Big Cone Spruce is about nine miles in, but it generally has reliable water. This is a shot of the camp. And then from here, it's another mile up out of the canyon to um, the top of the San Rafael Mountains, and that lets you tie into Mission Pine, the Mission Pine Trail. And so I'm going to mention that because there's a way to kind of stitch some of these places together that do have water. Also, I just kind of wanted to mention, I, you know, I did a rough count, and I came up with at least like 20 or 25 places in the backcountry that do seem to have, you know, generally reliable year-round water, uh, but there was no way to cover all of them. So, you know, um, just know that I'm not going to be putting all of the places in here. Uh, so this is uh, the Mission Pine Trail. I put in a little bit of mileage. It's nine miles in. Oh, let me back up. So you can start this one. This trail starts at Kachuma Saddle, so you can still access this even though the roads close because the closure starts right after Kachuma Saddle. Um, so you could drive up there. It's nine miles up the road to McKinley Spring, and then from McKinley Spring, it's another four and a half to Mission Pine, another four to Mission Pine Basin, and then for Mission Pine Basin, it's actually about three and a half miles down to where Coche Camp is. So you could kind of connect these these up. Uh, McKinley Spring has generally reliable water and Mission Pine Spring. So both of these are, are pretty good bets. Um, this is from a hike that uh, I did like some October, November back in 2014. And uh, we actually got to see a fox. We watched this fox. It was like kind of towards twilight. This fox scampered up uh, from the right-hand side of this view. And we thought it was just going to turn around and scamper back down. But it actually walked out into the middle road and sat down and scratched and yawned and put on a really great performance for us. It lasted about, you know, like five, six minutes. And then it wandered off the opposite side. Uh, so that was the sort of a treat that we got while we're out there. Um, this is just a view of basically that same place with some people hiking down the road. And uh, it's, it's a long road. You know, it's nine miles to McKinley uh, Spring. So you've really got to invest in that. But the payoff is that you get to get on Mission Pine Trail, which is one of the nicer trails in our backcountry. So what is this? It's about eight, eight and a half miles in. That's when you meet the trail coming up from Big Cone Spruce. Um, Sierra and I were out there, I think that was 2017. And we hiked in the rain, set up camp. And then overnight, that rain turned into snow. And so that was a real treat. So, you know, in the fall, it's great backpacking because the weather is, you know, the temperatures have cooled down. Um, but once you move into like, even even November December there is a chance of snow in, in our higher elevations and that's so that can be kind of fun as like just a, a way to mix up the hike a little bit if, if you're comfortable uh, snow camping um, I actually prefer camping and hiking in the snow to the rain because uh, you know don't get as wet and it's a little bit easier to to get a fire going from McKinley Spring the trail continues uh, eastward uh, up to McKinley Saddle and then climbs up towards San Rafael Mountain and then it arrives at uh, Mission Pine Spring. I'm sorry, I don't have like a better photo of it, but this this is what it basically looks like. A little trough was put in there to catch the water. Uh, this is this is generally reliable. I've seen water here like every single time I've been here, regardless of the time of year. From McKinley Spring, the trail continues along the top of the mountains towards West Big Pine, uh, Mission Pine Basin. This place is, I would say this is like, there's no water there right now. It, it, it generally dries up um, when you get into May. Uh, I was out there one May and this is a little side creek uh, probably like a quarter, half mile from the camp with the, the only place I could find water was pooled up under this rock. Um, and it was usable water, but I'm sure that was gone by August. So as I was saying, for Mission Pine Basin, you can tie into Santa Cruz Trail and, and connect, you know, back over to Coche uh, and all those other sites. So you could like stitch together a nice hike in that area for if you wanted a longer hike. Um, so now we're going to switch over to uh, the hot springs. So this is Little Caliente. I often say to people like one of the secrets to you know being a good uh, outdoor photographer is only show people your best photos and leave out the ones that aren't um, so the way to get to little caliente and i put that with a little um what is this the pink star um so let, let me back up so you used to be able to drive in along the romero come Wester road and you could actually drive all the way back to um almost to the hot springs, both Big Caliente and Little Caliente. But that road's been closed since um, I think it's 2017. Uh, and so now, as I was saying earlier, the only way in there is on foot or bike or horseback, although horseback would be kind of challenging. 
Um, so the way to get to Little Caliente is to start from Cold Spring Saddle. This is where the Cold Spring Trail, you know, that starts from behind Montecito, climbs up over the mountains and drops down the backside. But you can just drive up there and then hike down the Cold Spring Trail, continue to Four Bush Flats, and then continue on over to uh, Mono Camp. Um, so it drops down towards Four Bush. Uh, there's a camp, you know, at the edge of this meadow. Uh, you probably would have a hard time finding finding water there right now because it really depends on the, the rain. Um, last year I was there with Sierra and upstream we did found, find water, but the camp was dry. Um, this is called the Emerald Pools. This is continuing past Four Bush down towards the San Inez River. And this is a place where if I was going to go to Little Caliente right now, I would I would stop at the different pools in this section because they always have water year round. So I would gather up my water there because it's unlikely that I would find water at Mono or Little Caliente to drink. So this is one where I'd have to carry it in. This is a better trip in the springtime when there's more water and you still want to soak in the hot springs. But if you're the one to get out there, you just got to plan to bring your water. This is a shot from uh, the summertime. And this is just what one of these pools look like. Give you a feel for it. Um, this is San Inez River. This is from March of one year. I'm mostly putting it in to illustrate that this river can actually be impassable depending on the conditions. This time of year, it's gonna be like pretty much dry. So it's easy to cross. Um, this is from the Mono reroute. The old trail used to like follow uh, the river course, uh, I mean, the creek course of Mono and it would often get flooded and disappear. And if he's looking at this map where it's kind of called out the nose is like, you could kind of follow a trail all the way about then and then past that is where it really would get bad. And you know, I've heard stories of people like losing their shoes and getting lost there. And I've hiked there and had to just cross country uh, up the creek to get to Mono. So this route gets up on dry land and stays up there. It has a lot more up and down, um, but it's a little bit easier to follow. And when I was out there even talking to people, they didn't even know that there was a reroute. You know, they don't even know what they're missing. It's, it's gotten, so much easier than it used to be to, to do this hike. Um, here's a view of what's called the Mono Jungle. And so on the left is where the trail used to try to like find its route. Um, this is Mono Camp where uh, Sierra and I camped uh, for Valentine's Day because you have to go camping Valentine's Day with your girlfriend. And when we were there, this uh, hummingbird um, kept fluttering around while we were sitting at the picnic table. And I said, hey, I bet there's a nest nearby. And, and we just kind of looked around and found that there was. Uh, this is what the water looked like uh, Valentine's Day. So we, this was usable water. We could find a little trickle. This is what it looks like when there's no water, so it's just kind of dry. And this is what it looks like when we actually get a great year. This is more like in April when the water is really good. Um, from Mono Campground, it's about a three quarters of a mile up the road to get to Little Caliente. This upper pool here on the left is uh, a really nice temperature and the one below it is like a cooling off. And just put this map back in to give you a little perspective. The other one is Big Caliente, and you would take the same route. You would start from Cold Springs Saddle and go down the Cold Spring Trail, and then turn and head towards Cottom, and then make your way over towards Pebar Flat, Middle San Inez to get up to Rock Camp. And that whole hike is about nine and a quarter. Well, it's nine miles to Rock Camp, um, and nine and a quarter. And it's a quarter mile from there to, to Big Caliente. Um, so it's just a, a view looking down into Cottom, just kind of give you a sense the route would kind of continue north and turn to follow the river. Uh, this is from April, so it was already kind of drying. It's probably completely dry now. Um, Middle San Inez, this is where I would go look for water if I was going right now to Big Caliente, is uh, I would look for water around Middle San Inez because when I was in, out there in April, that water by Middle San Inez tasted a lot better than the water near Little Caliente. Um, when I was at Middle San Inez, I was sitting at one of the picnic tables just taking my lunch and I heard this rustling down in a creek and I, I thought it was like someone coming up the creek, but they're just moving too slow. So I went down to investigate and it turned out it was three wild turkeys rustling around. And I didn't think turkeys could fly that well. I was always thinking like they're an easy meal for the mountain lions. But as I followed these guys around or these gals to get a photo, um, they took off and flew. They were like pheasants. I was kind of blown away. I was like, wow, it would be hard to catch one of them. So I, my apologies to the turkeys. Um, so yeah, past the uh, middle San Inez, you turn up uh, the big Caliente road. This, this thing that says lower Caliente is actually rock camp. Um, that's, that's how it appears on most maps. And then from there, it's, just a, it's actually just a quarter mile to the hot spring. When I camped at rock camp back in April, uh, I must have seen like a dozen Arroyo toads. I thought I was on some freeway with all these toads cruising through in the middle of the night. This is what Big Caliente used to look like. Um, I heard reports that it was completely dry and now it does have some water, but it's like cold water. The, this, this spigot's not working right now. 
it's it's I don't know what it would take to get it to work again. But the two pools up past that are, are still in great shape. Uh, that farther pool is the warmer one. The closer one here with the the turtle stonework is the the cooling off pool. Um, these were actually like one of these was silted up, but some someone came out there and cleared it out, so they're both in good shape now. Um, just past them is Agua Caliente Debris Dam. I'm just mostly mentioning this because if, if you go to Big Caliente Hot Springs, um, it's if you have the time or interest, it's worthwhile to go up the canyon because it really turns into some really scenic area. Um, so I'm going to jump over now to Ventura. So this is Upper North Matillaha Canyon. And I apologize, I, have, I, have, uh, I haven't actually been there since the Thomas Fire. Um, so all of these are photos pre-Thomas Fire. So um, if you've been there since the Thomas fire, this is like sort of like a flashback of like, here's what it used to look like before it all got burned. Um, and now, you know, it's growing back. It's still, it's still a nice area. I've seen photos that people have posted. Um, why I'm showing this place is that there's year round water in Matilha Canyon at all of the campsites. So this is like an amazing place to go backpacking because it's pretty user friendly. Um, I put the mileage here. So like the first camp is a mile and a half. The second camp is four miles. The next one is 5.5. Maple camp is 7.5. So you could almost go out and just sort of pick your destination as you're out on the trail. This is from a Thanksgiving back in like, I don't know, 2010, um, really good year for water, but you would still find water at this crossing, um, just some views. This is what the water is at middle Matillaha. And then this is up at Maple Camp, like the water actually ends just past Maple. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite camps, and I think maybe I've been reluctant to go there since the fire because I was afraid all those great maple trees are gone, but someone told me that they're, they're still there. As you continue past Maple, the trail kind of rounds a corner and there's all these big cone spruces hiding around up here in this back area that's nice and shaded for them. Um, I always think that's kind of cool. It's like they're having a little party back there. Um, the trail tops out uh, on this map, as you can see, it tops out and, and climbs over this, I guess it's this little ridge and goes into Cherry Creek. So there is a back way into Maple. Uh, that's just four and a half miles. Uh, when that road's closed in the fall, that's kind of a, a decent hike too. And I mostly put this in here to show you this, this cool mountain lion tracks photos that I got along that road when it was snowing. Um, so the, the hot spring, so from Matilha Canyon, uh, the first hot spring you would see is Vickers. This is the one that um, Ecotopia manages now. Um, so it's, it's privately managed, if you will, but it's, you know, you can work, you can go to their website and see how to go visit it. Matilla Hot Springs, this is uh, closed to the public too. And then Wheeler Hot Springs is closed because um, they're just privately managed. Um, actually, Matilla is, is managed by the County of Ventura. So Willet and Sespe are the two back, um, the two hot springs you can access in Ventura County, and they both require backpacking to get to. Um, so Willet is nine and a half miles in, and Sespe is 15 miles in. So you could do Willet as an overnighter if you're a pretty ambitious uh, backpacker. Um, it'd be challenging to do Sespe as an overnighter because it's like 15 mile day in and 15 mile day back out. But I have met people who've done that. Um, I would do this as a three day if I wanted to go visit both of these. This is to remind me that I don't have a picture of bear camp, but bear is the first place. And I've usually seen standing water there that could probably be used. Uh, but if you cross the creek and work your way to the opposite side and find where Bear Creek flows in, you'll probably find better water. Um, this is a like three quarters of a mile past bear camp. Um, there's a little side trail that double back up to the spring. And looking at Hike Los Padres website, this looks like a pretty reliable spring. So this could be a water source along the trail. Uh, the Sespe flows intermittently in the you know, summer into winter. This is a view out towards Oak Flat. If you look down here in the lower, what is this, right-hand corner, you can kind of see some water. When I was out there December 2013, um, that standing, that big pool of water wasn't that appealing, but just a little bit um, upstream, there was flowing water. Uh, this year, I, I don't know, it's been a dry year. This is a view from the little side trail that goes up to Willet. So this is kind of showing where Willet Camp is. And there, there are a couple dilapidated uh, cabins down there. But near one of them is a water spigot that taps into uh, like a spring fed um, tank. So that's a reliable water source up in that area too. This is a Willet. Uh, I've heard different stories of how this tub got in here. All of them involve a helicopter. Um, so if you're curious, you can like research that and find out, or maybe you just have to talk to people figure out how they got there. This is the old Willet, the, the Joaquin Willet homestead. Um, this is continuing up past Willet to get over to Sespe Hot Springs. This is that view from 2013. And this is from, uh, this is actually from earlier in that same year, like back in February or March. So you can kind of see uh, how dramatically it can just change in our backcountry just over the course of moving through the seasons. 
the trail continues up, um, actually, I'm sorry, down, down the Sespe and then turns up the side canyon uh, to go to Sespe Hot Springs. Uh, there's some, there's a trail camp out there. And then there's like sort of a homemade camp here by these, these palms. And then the trail continues up. I'm not the trail. I mean, there's sort of a, a used trail, but the, actually there's a trail. The trail continues up, but the creek also does. And at this rock crop, rock outcrop is, is where the spring actually flows out. And I meant to look it up, but this is like, I think 120 degrees or some sort of like, you're not going to get in this water. Um, but this is where it comes out from the rocks. But if you go downstream a little bit, you know, back to kind of where those palm trees are, you can find like pools in the creek that are at a temperature that are suitable. And what's kind of cool about the Sespe is you can just kind of like hike up and down the creek and find the temperature you like, like, oh, that's too hot. I'm going to go downstream a little bit. And oh, it's a little cooler here. Um, I've, I've drank the water from this creek, you know, further downstream by the camp and filtered it. And it seems fine. Uh, when I've camped at uh, Big Caliente, I've had to use the water from the creek. And, you know, I felt okay doing that. The flavor wasn't that great, but um, I felt like that was okay because I was filtering it. Um, the next section of places I just want to show you is, is over by Pine Mountain Ridge. Uh, so the first place is Raspberry Spring. Uh, this is just like less than a half mile from the trailhead uh, near the Ray's Peak campground. Um, another factor in the backcountry in the fall that I hadn't mentioned because most of the camps that I picked don't, this doesn't play into too much. Um, but when we move into the fall, there are road closures that, that come in, there are seasonal road closures, and a lot of them start in November or December. And you kind of just have to go to the Forest Service website to look up and see what the current closures are. Um, Pine, the road to Pine Mountain Campground and Ray's Peak. I think closes in December. And so the only way in is backpacking after that. And it doesn't open up none of these, the roads that are seasonally closed typically don't open up till May. Um, so that does sort of make Raspberry Spring a, a backcountry destination for uh, a good portion of the year. Um, so out there one April with Sierra and um, we got snow, that was kind of a treat. Uh, this is where we were camping. Um, I put this picture here mostly because like, if you were standing here where I took this photo, if you just turn around, there's a little use trail that leads over to the spring. And this is Raspberry Spring. I would call this a reliable water source. I've seen water there since I was a kid. Um, when I was a kid, there was actually like this rain barrel. Now you just see remnants of it. In fact, this is from like 2013. So even those pieces of wood sticking up are gone now. There are actually wild raspberries that grow on Pine Mountain. Uh, I used to think that someone planted them right at the spring and that's how it got its name, but they're actually wild raspberries. Um, this is a spring from just uh, August when Sierra went out there. And it, this is like a really impressive flow. Um, you know, a friend of mine was kind of conjecturing that uh, what, we might by, what we might start seeing as a weather pattern is we get the same amount of rain that we would get in a year, but we just get it in fewer storms. So it's more intense because um, we did get some, a couple good storms. We just didn't get any other rain to help it out. Um, as I was saying, like a spring or in dry times of the year or droughts, water sources can really concentrate wildlife. And so a fun exercise that I did was just to go out and sit at the spring from like eight to 10 in the morning and just track the, the birds that come into it or the wildlife. Uh, these are pygmy nuthatches, red-breasted nuthatch, um, stellar jay, woodpeckers, uh, squirrels will come in, the pigeons. Uh, when I was doing this uh, little experiment, I was sitting there and I noticed the pigeons would sort of creep in and sit on these branches, but never come down to the spring. And I almost started thinking that like pigeons don't drink water, uh, but they're just really cautious. And then they eventually did come down. And when the pigeons started drinking, everyone else was like, well, it seems like if the pigeons are thinking it's safe, we should all get in on this. And at one point, I, I actually thought I was going to be overrun by wildlife because there were so many animals coming down here to get a drink. And then wouldn't you know it, this one squirrel comes down and takes a look at me and just gets really upset, just starts chirping really loud, giving an alarm call and spooked everyone out of there. And so that kind of ended the party, but it was funny that this squirrel was just like, why, why is there this big potential predator sitting right by the spring and no one cares? So that was the police. Um, so when I was up there in August of Sierra, I took one of my trail cameras and tested to the tree overlooking the spring just to see what I would get. And um, this was actually a big score for a trail camera because this is just one day, like overnight. So a family of deer came in and got a drink and two golden eagle, two juvenile golden eagles came and got a drink. So that was pretty exciting for the amount of, you know, investment to put the cameras up. So in the same area, um, the Jean Marshall Piedra Blanca Trail is a great fall destination. I've always seen water at Upper Reyes and Bear Trap. I've gone out there Thanksgiving a couple of times. Um, 
you can just come from Reyes Creek and you know go up to Bear Trap. That's like four and a half miles, or I guess four point seven miles. So it's a great overnighter. Or you can do it as a shuttle trip, and you know go from one side over to the Pedro Blanca side, and that's about twenty miles. Um, I did that as a three day this last Thanksgiving. So this is a great destination for the fall because a there's water, and this area, even in the springtime, is a really scenic area. There's an incredible amount of plant diversity. Uh, I put this photo in here to remind me that this trail, once it crosses a creek, you'll see some poison oak, and then you won't see any poison oak for like the next 18 miles, 17 miles. It's like, if you don't like poison oak, this is a great trail because you're not going to see any until you get over towards the Pedro Blanca. Uh, this is uh, Upper Reyes. It's uh, got cedars, you know, it's uh, tucked in amongst the cedars. Um, the trail comes up from Reyes Creek Campground and goes up one canyon drops down into Upper Reyes Camp and then climbs out of that canyon and drops down into uh, Bear Trap Canyon. This is from this year Thanksgiving and this is from 2014 Thanksgiving when there was a little bit less water going on but there was still great water there. Um, this is the second bear scat photo when we're out there, me and Sierra back in 2014, we saw a lot of scat like this and it took us a while to figure out what these were. These looked like cherry pits but they were smaller than the holly leaf one and it turned out it was choke cherry. Um, and this is what it looks like in the spring when it's in bloom. Um, so when I was out there with my buddy Casey this past Thanksgiving, there was actually a little bit of snow and we were kind of kind of joking like, well, we're really lucky because the snow is just sort of like pretty right now. It's not super deep. We're not having to fight it. We're not having to figure out where the trail is, it's just really making things all kind of decorated. Um, this is one of the scenic areas to me as you're hiking up the trail towards Haddock is that there are just these really lush sections where there's all these alder trees with this understory of, I think it's a Quran plant. And it's just the amazing variety of plants makes this like a, a definitely an A-list trail. Um, this is climbing up out of the bear trap drainage and then dropping down into Haddock. And then I put the map in here because um, Haddock also connects with a trail that goes along um, Pine Mountain Ridge and ties back in over to like Ray's Peak, Pine Mountain Campground. So you could also come in this way uh, a little bit more when the roads open and, and connect over here. Um, Haddock doesn't have reliable year-round water, um, but the next camp three mile depends on the year and the Mount, Pine Mountain Lodge does have uh, reliable water. Uh, that's just some scenery from Thanksgiving of this past year. Uh, that's three mile camp. And then this is a uh, Pine Mountain Lodge. And this, the trail crosses, I mean, there's a side trail that goes to the camp and it crosses the creek and that creek is kind of intermittent depending on the year. But if you just follow that creek up a little bit, you'll find a reliable uh, year round water source. This water is really good. There's also another Pine Mountain campsite that um, it's too hard to describe where it is, but I haven't seen reliable water there. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. Uh, so the trail kind of past Pine Mountain starts its way down into the, um, down towards Piedra Blanca Trailhead and, and the Sespe River. Uh, I didn't put in pictures of those two camps, but Twin Forks and Piedra Blanca Camp both have year-round water. Those are nice little overnight destinations. They're like, you know, three, four miles in coming in from the Piedra Blanca side. The next place I wanted to show you, and this is the last area, is the Mount Pinos area. Um, this also has um, some year-round water. This is also a great place to go, you know, so we're, we're in the springtime, right? We're backpacking, it's great. You know, there's lots of water, temperatures are pleasant. Around mid-May, the temperatures in our backcountry start to shift where it like it starts to become not as pleasant. And by June, it's not so great to be out. But if you move to higher elevation, you can sort of extend your backpacking season. Like even July 4th weekend is great here at uh, Mount Pinos because um, the temperatures aren't as bad. So I'm gonna describe the route coming up Boy Scout from Boy Scout Road, Boy Scout Camp Road up to Lillian Sheep. You could also come in um, from the trailhead, the Mount, the Mount Pinos trailhead and just hike the Tumamaya Trail. Um, from that starting point, it's just four and a half miles to Sheep Camp. Um, but I'm gonna show you coming up from Boy Scout Camp Road. If you're gonna be doing a hike in the Sierras, this is a good warm up hike because you're gonna get some good elevation gain. Sheep Camp is at like, what is it like 8,600 feet? Um, so you're going to get some higher elevation than you'd find elsewhere in our local area. And the elevation gain that you're going to do on the hike is, is a good conditioning hike. Um, this one actually has the miles on the sign, so that's great. Uh, this is uh, the waterfall. Just So it, it follows a road, an access road. And then just as the road, just as the road ends, uh, there's this waterfall. And then the trail climbs up out of the Lockwood Valley area and makes its way up to Lily Meadows. This is a shot of the creek 
a little bit before Lily Meadows, because when I was out here Labor Day two years ago, uh, there wasn't really any water at Lily Meadows, but if uh, downstream there was a little bit down here in this thicket of willows that I was able to find that was a, a good source. And I, I think, although Lily Meadows wouldn't necessarily have reliable water, if you if you track the creek and kind of notice as you're hiking in, you might be able to find some. Um, that's the camp. From Lily Meadows, it, it kind of goes up the drainage a little bit, which is kind of pleasant. And then it really starts its steep climb. And uh, this is uh, some moral support I found on the hike, a deer. Uh, and then brings you up to sheep camp. And there is a spring at sheep camp. This is a generally reliable water source. Although a couple of years ago, it wasn't working because the spring got clogged or damaged. So that's sort of a factor in some of these types of springs. Um, but in terms of water availability, you know, if the spring hadn't been damaged, then there would have been water there. Um, this is a, what is this called? The Missouri flag iris. Uh, so Lily Meadows is actually misnamed because whoever named it thought that these were lilies, um, but they're actually irises. Uh, if you want to see the iris when you're out there, July is the time to go. Any later in the year, you're, you're going to miss out. So if that's like on your list of things to see, then aim for July for sheep camp. Um, past sheep camp, the trail continues just a short ways up the Tumamaya Trail. So you could tie in over to the trail at least to Mesa Springs. So that's the last camp I'm going to show you. Uh, Tumamaya Trail is named for Vincent Tumamaya, and he was a Shumash elder who helped, you know, uh, revive interest in Shumash culture through, you know, storytelling and sharing Shumash songs and, you know, like going to schools and doing presentations and really just making people aware of the richness of, of the Shumash culture in our area. And so he's honored with the, the name of this trail. Uh, Mesa Spring Trails drops down from the top of the mountain, goes through pine country and then transitions down into uh, Juniper Pinon Pine and then gets to the spring. Um, so this is actually like a full on rain barrel uh, I like on Hyklos Padres, there's a little warning note that says, you know, the spring is reliable, but check and make sure there's no dead birds in it. Um, so it, it could it could be funky. So know that that's a variable. Uh, these are Lawrence's goldfinches that were enjoying the water. This is actually the place that inspired me to want to get a trail camera. I was like, wow, man, if I could put a camera out here. Um, I haven't done it yet because it's kind of hard to get to. Raspberry Springs was a lot easier. This is the camp at um, San Amigdo Mesa. And then just past that, the trail continues out across San Domingo Mesa, which is a big flat plain. And from the road up to the top of Cerno Oeste Mountain, you get a really great view of that mesa. It's, it's a really uh, distinctive area in the backcountry. So that's all the time I have for all those different places. Just a reminder, I have a wild camera, wildlife camera tracking class coming up. And then I'm also offering a, a series of hikes starting in November. And then one last resource, this is my blog. So uh, the old articles that I've written are all there. And once I make the announcements for these two upcoming workshops, they'll be there. And so the web address is up there in the corner. And then I put my email in here. If you guys had questions and wanted to reach me or wanted to get on my list uh, for my upcoming talks or just want to subscribe to the blog to catch uh, the announcements, I put that there. All right, Ahmad, Let's see if we have any questions. Oh. That was a wonderful presentation, James. That was really great. Very informative. Um, lots of questions. Actually, you're, the mindfulness thing you threw out there, you were just crossing these questions out left <laughs> and right. I was like, someone's asked a question, and then like a second later, you were just on it. So I like this. We should practice this more often. Yeah, nice. <laughs> Um, so there are some questions, though, that just wasn't, you know, the power okay. wasn't there, no, but there were some. So we, we'll get through them here. Maybe they wanted to hold them till the end. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so uh, the one question, um, the first question that, uh, that came up was on that High uh, Close Padres website that you showed us. Uh -huh. uh, the question was, just, can this be updated by anyone? Is it, is it yeah. open source yeah. in that sense? You just register yeah. and, okay. So if I want to do, do a trail report, let's see, where is it? Oh, see, right here. So I would just, I just fill this out. Okay, know? perfect. So I could go, you know, you know, I could change the date, type in my name, put a little note like, hey, there was great water there and I saw a bear and that was cool. And then I submit it. Um, so yeah, there, it's, it's entirely user generated. Um, and so it is a mixed bag because like, if someone doesn't go there, then no one's going to report that. If I go on a hike and I don't put some notes in, then that's information that only I know. Um, but it is it is a great living resource. So, no, that's great. That's good to know. Um, another question that came in is how do you get uh, to Upper Matillahe and Maple? 
Uh, we day hiked to Middle uh, Middle Matilaha Falls, and it seemed to end up oh. falls. So, so there are there are two trails. Well, not two trails, but uh, Matilaha is a word that's used for a number of places. So, those people who hike, they started at the Matilaha trailhead at the end of the road, and if you continue up the main canyon, mostly going west, that will take you to Matilaha Falls. And there's not really anywhere to camp there. There's like some throwdown campsites that people have made, but the falls is like its own destination. But if you're doing that hike, you would pass the turnoff up Matillaha, North Fork Matilla Canyon. And that's where the trail camps are that I'm talking about. So they're two separate canyons off the Matillaha Creek. Okay. So if you get to the falls one, that's pretty much that there. Yeah, kind of the trail kind of dead ends at Matillaha Falls. Okay. But on that hike, you're going to pass the turnoff um, to Upper North Fork Matillaha, which is uh, which is where the trail camps are, and that's a nicer place to camp because there's more space and yeah, it's just a better place to camp. And then I got another question here for you, James. Uh, have you been to fish bowls in the Sespe? And if you have, what's it like? I've been to fish bowls. Uh, there's an article on my blog, not to promote the blog, but there's a picture of it in a description. Um, I thought of, there was a, a number of places I thought of including in this talk, um, just because there's a lot of amazing places in the backcountry. Uh, as far as I can tell, fish bowls and cedar Creek camp don't necessarily have year-round water, kind of depends on the year, but if you go out in the springtime or even Memorial Day, depending on it, Fish Bowls is a pretty cool site. Um, you make sort of a loop hike, you can tie in both those camps. It's not too bad of a hike, you know, it's like under 10 miles round trip to do all of that. So I would definitely recommend it. It's a cool thing to see. It's like just a carved out pool in the sandstone creek and yeah. Um, the there was, there was a, a couple questions. Um, well, a couple questions regarding uh, the quality or the safety of the drinking the water at the springs. Um, how how do you approach it? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I would not want to gather water right at the hot spring because too many people are using them. Um, so I'm kind of when I'm in the back I'm kind of gauging how far I am from where people might be, you know, getting in the water and bathing. So at little, I'm sorry, at uh, Big Caliente. Um, Rock Camp is a, about a quarter mile downstream from the hot spring. So to me, that's like, well, that's enough, you know, ground that that water has covered to naturally filter itself and have other groundwater runoff meet it and kind of mitigate that a little bit. Um, so I've, I've done that twice when I'm there. I've used that water and I felt okay about that. Um, when I was out there in April, what I did notice is that the water at Middle San Inez Campground tasted a lot better. So I wish I'd loaded up there and just carried the water for like, you know, two, three miles because it just tasted better. Um, at Sespe Hot Springs, that creek is so, you saw the flow. That's like a definitely big flow. Um, and that camp within that photo, that's like a, like a mile below the hot spring um, or at least a half mile. So that flow really helps mitigate that too. And there are some, a couple side creeks seasonal that flow into it. So, you know, I look at that, that offsets that, but I would not just go dip my cup, you know, near where I think people are bathing or even like, you know, filter that because it's, man, I don't want to do that. I got uh, some questions are rolling in. This is great. That's great. Um, so uh, this question is, uh, do you hold or can you recommend workshops on packing appropriately for extended hikes? Um, and then a comment additional to that, someone needs to start a scouts program for adults, <laughs> unless it exists already. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I do teach a, a backpacking class in the spring called Backpacking Made Easy. And so we, we cover, you know, gear and trip planning and, you know, a lot of those aspects of what I would call like the, the technical skills. But then I also do mix in route finding and working with maps. And then I also include nature connection, which is learning what I'd call wilderness awareness skills, because that really deepens one's experience in the backcountry. And I find that those skills have really improved my route finding skills that I've honed over the years, uh, because it's not just about a compass or a GPS. It's about really listening to what the landscape is telling you. And, you know, I've found things out there that I felt kind of guided to like, wow, I was lucky that I looked there for water or I'm lucky that I thought to bring water from here. I don't know why I thought that or, you know, so that mindfulness kind of can in, both enrich in the experience and sort of improve the ease of the trip. Um, so I try to blend that in a little bit. Uh, Scouts for adults, that's a, you know, I think the closest, not like scouting program, but I want to give a little plug to the Los Padres Forest Association because they do volunteer trail work projects and they actually do backpack into places. And the cool thing about a lot of their projects is you get to drive on forest service roads as part of the project, part of the way. So someplace that it might take you three days to get to, you know, you drove in and only have to hike in the first day. 
And then, you know, in exchange for that, you're doing trail work, but that's like giving back. And you really get to learn a lot of how trails are made. And you get to meet a lot of people who are like, potentially like hardcore backpackers. So it's a great place to pick people's brains. Like, hey, that gear you have, what do you like about it? What do you like about it? Um, or where have you been? So um, that's a great resource to go just check out. It's uh, lpforest.org and their calendar has upcoming programs. I mean, not programs, but projects. Uh, they're all on hold right now because the forest is closed, but you know, just keep checking back in. Thank you, James. Um, there were some uh, questions a couple people have uh, put out about like the, the crowds or how crowded are are these. I know the pictures you, you, you showed us were like, <laughs> it's like an oasis, no one's there. But in, in reality, I know it depends on rain and time of the year, but can you expect to see other people around the area? Um, yeah, that's a great question, Ahmad, because um... I haven't been, I've only been to the CESPI like a couple of times because it's just like too many people there for me. Um, when I was out there in December with my girlfriend and my sister, I, I, you know, I often just ask people like, hey, where are you going? Where are you camping? Where are you from? And then I sort of got obsessed on that trip because everyone I talked to was from somewhere else. You know, uh, someone was from British Columbia, someone from Alaska, someone from Spain, someone from New York. And I literally like, started talking to every single person just trying to find someone from the local area. And I found someone from Camarillo. I'm like, okay, okay, a local. Um, the truth is that the Sespe Hot Springs is the most popular destination in our backcountry. Um, just like, you know, Inspiration Point and Montecito Hot Springs is the most popular fun country trail. Um, if you go during the week, that can kind of help you. Uh, I went out there Thanksgiving one year and it was a zoo. Um, so I would definitely like plan to avoid that. Um, Little Caliente, because of that Mona reroute, it's pretty easy to get to. I mean, it's not easy, like, oh, I'll just walk there, but um, it's much easier. So I, I saw a big crowd on President's Day weekend, Big Caliente, that's a little bit longer walk, nine and a half miles or nine miles. So that kind of filters out some people. Um, but hot springs are just popular. Uh, you know, if you're going to these other destinations that I highlighted, maybe not as many. The Manzana is a popular area. Um, yeah. There are places that just don't see as many people like the Agua Blanca. I didn't include that in this talk, but the Agua Blanca doesn't see many people. Um, it's mostly just, you know, finding places that people don't go as much. Um, I don't have a better answer for that. No, so no. it is possible to have like a wilderness experience if you know where to look. And yeah, there are some popular areas too. Yeah, no, there's a few things I'm taking notes here. So like turkeys are fast and uh, avoid cherry trees. <laughs> I'm going a different direction to see a cherry tree. <laughs> no. Um, and I know that you touched upon, uh, there was a question that if you encounter a bear, you know, what should you do? Um, and you kind of touched upon that a little bit, but to the you know, couple people that have asked questions about that is you just maybe reiterate um, just what you said earlier, because they, they, they missed that part of the presentation. Yeah, so the, the bears in our backcountry in, in our area are, are, I would say timid. They, they just don't want to interact with people. So they, they often scamper out. And I know there's people out there right now going like, hey, I live in Montecito and I see bears coming down into my neighborhood. And you know that's a different scenario because they're like foraging and exploring their area. Um, so they're getting a little more habituated to people. But in the backcountry, the times when I've run into bears, they've generally just scampered off. Um, you know, the exceptions would be if they feel intimidated. You know, if I was like somehow taking a threat, threatening stance that might change that equation. Um, you know, the classic one is if they have cubs, but um, even then, you have to get in between the mother and the cubs. The stories I've heard where people were attacked by bears usually involve like someone's dog antagonizing the bear or, you know, people just being too aggressive with them. Um, if you do see a bear or a mountain lion, for example, that looks like it is, you know, taking interest in you, then yeah, you want to make yourself as big as possible. And you don't want to run because that's going to trigger, you know, uh, their instinct, particularly with mountain lions, to chase you. But get big and, and use a, a firm voice. You know, like, hey, no, hey, you know, like start talking to the animal and kind of make it understand that it's not worth its while. Um, you know, something my sister says that um, animals want to try to avoid conflict because anytime they're in a conflict, they're burning up energy. And so they're going to first go like, gee, can we just get out of this situation? Then I don't have to waste any energy. You know, if we were to grapple, I could risk injury. That's like a bad deal. That's going to cost energy. So sometimes they might just try bluffing, um, you know occasionally a bear might bluff charge but in general in our area they, they scamper off you know so so i wouldn't be too intimidated by oh there's bears out there because i used to, i used to be like that like oh there's bears out there but now that i've had these encounters i'm like oh there's bears out there so 
Okay, and I got just a couple more here. For oh, that's fine. Keep them coming. We we'll respect everyone's time here. Um, what's the what was the elevation um, in the photos that you showed where there was snow or that you actually woke up to snow? Yeah, so I don't have that memorized, but um, the San Rafael Mountains. So that was McKinley Spring and San Rafael Mountains. I think those are in the four thousands, five thousand feet. Uh, Reyes Peak, I know, is in like five to six thousand feet, and then the Mount Pinos. I didn't put any snow pictures, but you can go cross country skiing and snowshoeing up the Mount Pinos, and that's like eight eight hundred feet. Oh wow! Um, so whereas the the San Ynez Mountains are more like in the three thousand, just coming up to four thousand. So, so if we get a good rain and the temperatures are right, we can get snow in in our backcountry. Cold Springs. Um, are permits required to camp along the trails? Um, if yes, how far in advance should one begin the process to get one? That, that's a great question. Uh, there are no longer permits required to go into our backcountry, um, but you do need a fire permit. And it's easy to get a fire permit. You go to, um, I don't know the website off the top of my head, but you just go to the website and you watch a little fire safety video and then you click a box and then fill out some form and then you get a fire permit that you can print out. So you are required to have a fire permit. and Really, the purpose of that video is to just make sure that you have the awareness skills of how to, you know, uh, practice, you know, fire safety in the backcountry. Um, right now, there are no campfires allowed in the backcountry because we're in a, a fire ban. So that's another thing to track. Um, I forgot to mention it on the road conditions. If you go to the Forest Service website and go to current conditions, there's a page that will show you which roads are open and closed. It'll also, in that same area, show you what the current fire uh, ban is or requirements are. So you can, you can go get updated on information pretty easily. And I guess a plug for the Forest Service, if, if you just call their office, they're happy to answer that question too, you know, so. No, that's sweet. Um, let's see here, I'm trying to see this here. We get the elevation of snow. Um, could we get one more time, uh, James, the, uh, the, the, the page that you had with those uh, dates of the, the hikes that you, you have planned that, Yes, the take five yeah. hikes. So I'm going to get this on my blog, um, and I might change which day I do which hike. I got to figure that out just because, you know, the trails are kind of closed right now. So this will be on our local trails, and it'll be a different trail each day. So I might have to change the order just to work with what's available. But um, these are pretty much the themes I'm going to work with. And like I say, it's a blend of some natural history, mindfulness, you know, some of these trail skills, and, and just getting out on, on a hike. Um, and then since we're here, this is the camera class it'll be at the botanic garden and i haven't gotten that on my blog either yet because we're just finalizing what the what the announcement will say um each of these hikes are gonna these hikes are gonna be like uh 25 dollars each but if you sign up for all five it's 20 bucks each so uh, there is a cost to them uh just to you know help me offset organizing everything and bring in the skills Oops. sweet um so i just want to thank you james for that wonderful presentation it was Great, great to learn a little bit of our backcountry here. Um, I want to also let everybody know that's still here that uh, the, the presentation is, is recorded and uh, we plan to get it up on the YouTube site. Um, when we do, we'll send an email out to everyone and I'm sure James, we could get it on a newsletter too with the link for the YouTube page for the people that uh, might've missed the presentation today. Mm -hmm. um, want to also do uh just a reminder for it's on the library's website uh for the next one next trail talks uh, scheduled for october 14th uh with sarah dykeman that's the reschedule um and that's going to be at 5 30 thursday night uh that's the bicycling with butterflies um and uh once again i want to thank you james that is a great presentation a very active uh group questions and chat um, want to plug the the blog one more time songs of the wilderness.com please if you're not in james's newsletters please 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 uh get on that newsletter you could show james their way that they can access or to add themselves to the, your newsletter from your blog there um <clears throat> i'd have to go to the website but this is the what the homepage looks like so if you just kind of scroll down below where it says categories there's a like you know sign up for a notification or whatever so it's right there on the home page Yep, and please, if you're not following it, follow it, get the updates for the classes that are coming up and 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 more trail talks information as well as uh, potential workshops that you know we're going to try to work on, try to work together here to get some out there. Um, yeah, and Ahmad, thank, thanks for hosting this. And uh, if you see that email or even Ahmad's email, you can email either one of us to say, I want to get on the library list to know when the next 
you know, Backcountry Trail Talk is through the library because we'll add you to the list so you get the notification. Yep. We really appreciate everyone's time today, especially appreciate you, James. Great presentation. Thank you all so much for attending. Thanks, everyone.